Good afternoon. Welcome to our webcast on professionalism and long-term value, helping banks to build mature cultures. My name is Rima Ahmed from the Chartered Banker Institute, and today I'm delighted to introduce Stuart Wallard and Paul Kearns. Paul is the founder and chair of the Maturity Institute, a new multidisciplinary professional development body established in 2012 to address the professional development needs of leaders and managers for a capitalist system focused on creating maximum societal value. He is also a senior partner in a UK-based advisory firm, Organisational Maturity Services, which has developed the Omindex for adoption by Maturity Institute as its main measure of total stakeholder. Stuart is a managing partner of Organisational Maturity Service and co-founder and council member of the Maturity Institute. Stuart is leading pioneering work using MI's Omnidex to show how the very best organisations are able to serve society, build effective human value systems and provide the greatest benefit for all stakeholders. If you have any questions during the presentation, please use the online function to submit these and Stuart and Paul will try to answer as many as they can towards the end. I hope you enjoy today's webcast, and I'll now hand you over to Stuart and Paul. Hi, this is uh, Paul Kearns, who's the chair of the Maturity Institute. Thank you, Rima, for that introduction. Um, I'm just going to do a brief introduction to the Institute uh, in a little bit more detail, and then I'm going to hand over to Stuart, who will be presenting most, if not all, of the slides we're going to go through today. Um, we started the Institute back in 2012, as Rima said. Uh, the group that came together to form the uh, Institute, if I said we were all uh, seasoned professionals, but all from a, a different background, my own background in human resource management, um, I think the reason, two reasons we came together, one is we were looking at the world and saying, what's going wrong with organizations? We see, see news stories every day about banks. Uh, finance companies, uh, big corporations, pharmaceutical companies, they all seem to have huge problems these days in keeping out of the news and just getting on with business. And I think one of the reasons we came together was, you know, what could we do about this? Where is this going wrong? Uh, and we brought our multidisciplinary approach to the piece. But actually, probably the best way to describe what the Maturity Institute is about is if you imagine um, what you have to do to become a, a medical doctor, the number of years you have to go through in terms of professional training to be able to be a doctor. And we thought long and hard about if you wanted to be the ultimate professional organizational manager, doesn't matter what discipline or field you come from, you know, what would be the sort of qualification you would need to be able to, uh, able to manage organizations better? So, so we use the analogy of the medical profession, and we read straight across and start talking about the health of organizations. And I think capitalism is looking pretty unhealthy at the moment, and we need to rethink some of our basic ideas about what management means, what the purpose of organizations is, etc. And I think particularly for those on the call today, um, I don't know if you've ever thought about your job in banking as being a social service as opposed to a business operation. Um, but at the Maturity Institute, we see them as one and the same. Uh, we need a safe, uh, effective banking system as much as we need a national health service. We take a whole system view of the world, and, and every part of it needs to be working well if the whole system's going to work well. So that's quite an ambitious project, if you like, for the Maturity Institute. Um, but our aim is to set professional standards, and more importantly, to introduce measurement to in, into areas that never had measurement before. These are mainly around the intangibles in organizations. Certainly from my background in people management, it's been notoriously uh, short on really good measures of the value of good people management practice. Um, but, but more recently, we've got into measuring culture and governance and big issues in all organizations that need to be addressed. And we work, to the, work on the basic principle that if you can't measure the problem and can't define it very well, then you're not likely to do much about solving it. So um, that's more or less the introduction to the Maturity Institute. And I think the particular relevance of this webinar is, again, if you're in, from the banking sector as you are, then the chances are the board of directors um, and the chief executive of your bank or your organization is feeling the pressure at the moment in terms of being able to demonstrate to the world that governance and culture in a bank is as healthy as it can be. So I'm going to hand over to my colleague Stuart now, who will take us through uh, the rest of the slides. 
Thanks very much, Paul. Uh, so my name is Stuart Woolard, um, and I uh, co-founded the Maturity Institute with Paul some time ago. My, my, my background is slightly different. I actually started in the accounting world, spent nearly 10 years in the accounting world, but have worked in corporate and an academic environment since. Um, but but uh, the last five, six years has, has been full-time with the Maturity Institute and, and, and being part of that and running a, a, the, effectively the, the trading part of MI, which is, which is RMS. Um, so um, the first uh, thing we really want to talk about is to pick up on what Paul said, and and and, and this is a theme which has been um, uh, emerging um, probably over the last ten years plus years or so, but really started to crystallise uh, and, and draw attention uh, ten years ago in, uh, with the global financial crash. And I think there's a widespread recognition that we have a fundamental problem with the nature of the, the business system we work within um, and, and, and the capitalist system we work within and, and there's lots of commentary analysis and an and, and opinion around, uh, around that um, and, and lots of movements to try and shift us forward um, but we don't find that many offerings of solutions. There's a lot of uh, identification of the problem, but but little in the way of, of sort of coherent uh, analysis and, and, and a way forward. And that's really where where, where we uh, try to position ourselves and, and show organisations that there is a way forward. Um, and the first slide in front of you is, is a set of quotes, um, uh, and uh, one is from uh, a couple of Scottish brothers, uh, the Hopper brothers. Um, and they wrote a, uh, a fantastic book called The Puritan Gift, which is actually a core text for the Maturity Institute. Anybody that comes in and, uh, uh, and, and works with us and trains with us will, will be introduced to this book. Um, and, and they talk about how organizations changed uh, during the course of the 20th century and became fixated and focused on profit maximization, uh, essentially since the 1970s. And, 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 and the pivotal moment was really Milton Friedman uh, suggesting and stating that organizations, uh, if they maximize profits, then they, then they serve society as well. And, and what we've realized since that time and, and, and very crucially today is that, um, you know, a profit-driven motive uh, shapes corporate culture uh, in, in a very profound way. Um, it shapes the actions. And it shapes the people, uh, people's behavior uh, within organizations in a way which, uh, as we've seen, has led to widespread corporate failures, the financial crash, issues in major pharmaceutical companies, media organizations, uh, Carillion being a very recent example. Um, and I don't think we need to spend much time to recognize that, that you know, we have a problem. In, in fact, uh, we're probably at the start of a transition. And uh, I think that transition is reflected in the second quote, which is a quote from Larry Fink's uh, letter to, uh, to, uh, to CEOs. And, and, and Larry Fink's letter, uh, and many of you will, may have read this, uh, he's chairman and CEO of BlackRock, uh, one of the, you know, the biggest, most influential investment houses in the world. And what Larry Fink has that is now saying is, is, is profit is no, is no longer the paradigm which we need to exist within. Uh, and effectively, organizations have got to move from a shareholder-based focus, a shareholder value focus, to one which is about serving stakeholders. It's about uh, ultimately serving society. And that's quite a, a profound and important statement to make from someone in, in, in his position. I think that's... That, that reflects and articulates exactly where we are, is that I think there's a widespread recognition that we do need to shift our organizations to a place where they are serving stakeholders and society, uh, because the damage that's been, been done by a much narrower focus on profits has, has led to a, a skewing of actions and behaviors, which has been to the detriment of, of everybody, including the shareholders, the organizations, have supposed to have been serving for the last 40 years or so. Um, so uh, the Maturity Institute, uh, our aim, uh, as Paul alluded to, is to simply show that firms and organizations who set out to serve society, serve people in local communities, um, and have a purpose where, 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 where you know, customers 
come first. Um, those organisations who have that kind of purpose and more uh, and importantly are also able to align all the people that are connected to their organisation to that purpose. And when we talk about people in that context, we talk about workers, suppliers, customers, uh, regulators, and anybody that touches an organisation. If, an organi if those organisations that can align all those people and build systems to leverage the value potential of those people towards a goal which ultimately serves society, then actually they achieve the best outcomes. And we'll show you a bit later some of the evidence of that in a banking context. Um, so, you know, our aim is to clearly demonstrate that there's no, uh, that there's a mutually inclusive uh, goal of serving society and serving shareholders, which can be created at the same time. And actually, those organisations that get it right will maximise value for both society and shareholders at the same time. So, Paul, if we want to move on to the second slide. Um, so, how do we go? How do we how do we go about showing this? How do we demonstrate that culture matters? Um, the, you know, uh, the governance culture, the management of people within an organisational context matters. Uh, and our starting point is to use the diagnostic instrument um, of as what Paul has said is, is an instrument of measuring organizational health. And that's called, we call this an organizational maturity rating. So on this slide, on the left-hand side, you'll see a big uh, circle. And then in the middle, you'll see what's, what we've labeled as organizational maturity rating. And we designed this rating alongside a Standard & Poor's affiliate organization some years ago. Uh, and uh, that organization was motivated to work with us on the basis that they felt very strongly that financial rating and financial analysis was not providing the, the whole view of organizational health. It was missing something very, very fundamental. There were, all, 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 there were other issues around uh, traditional credit ratings as well in terms of being backwards looking, uh, and, 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 and other issues around conflicts of interest. And, and, and a lot of it came out of the, the, the reputational damage of the, the, the financial crisis, which, uh, which meant that credit rating agencies were no longer seen as, as quite the organizations we could trust before that. Um, so we designed this, this rating to measure what we call organizational health, or, or, or it, 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 we can use the word governance or culture. Um, or even the, the management of the human ecosystem. We use these words in, interchange, in, interchangeably. And the important thing about our measurement of, of, of organizational health in this context is that it's done on a whole system basis. It's looking at the whole organization, not specific component parts. So a lot of times you see uh, regulators, people talk about issues of culture and they might relate them to bad incentives. They might relate them to bad CEOs. They might even relate them to rogue employees. Um, and, and what you're seeing demonstrated is, is, is a compartmentalization uh, and, and really looking at uh, small as smaller aspects of, 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 of a whole organization. And until we look at the whole organization, we can't offer up the very best uh, solution to how to fix uh, any culture that has gone bad or even a good culture which which can still be improved so our rating does this and as you see in that diagram we, we, we we're measuring what Paul has suggested are, are, are intangibles so we look at uh, purpose trust uh, engagement cooperation uh, knowledge learning and innovation we look at to what extent an organization works as a whole system does it really work coherently and cohesively we look at decision making and communication. We look at the nature of quality systems within an organization. We also look at performance reward. And probably one of the most important things we look at is how does an organization define and manage value? Um, and if we come back to the start, the, the, the management of that value over the last 40 years and still the prevailing paradigm is that value is very much seen in financial terms. It's looking at underlying profit and profit growth um, and we look at, need to look at value in a much wider sense um, and at, the, uh, at MI we have a very clear definition of value which 
includes revenue and cost as the financial elements of value, but looks at the quality of the organization, the quality of products and services, and also looks at the productivity and output of an organization. And when we see value in that context, um, and the management of value uh, as a whole, um, that's a much more important uh, whole system view of value and how all human beings connect, connect to that. So that's, that's how we construct or conceptualize our rating. We're measuring all these component parts, uh, and that's an important thing to understand. We're actually putting a number on these things. We're quantifying something which most commentators, regulators, advisors, media uh, talk about in, in and articulate as a narrative, as a story, as opposed to something which we can turn into a quantitative number and actually relate to meaningful uh, value and actually in financial terms. So what this slide also shows you is when we rate an organization, we're rating the culture of the organization, the organizational health. Uh, what we've also been able to, to look at is to say, well, what does that rating actually reflect? Um, and what it actually reflects is the extent to which an organization captures and manages value that's created through and for all its human stakeholders. So this is a, this is a, this is a measurement of stakeholder uh, value creation. You know, all the human beings that are connected to an organization we're understanding the extent to which an organization is able to realize the value potential of, of, of all those people. Um, and what we've actually been able to, to do, and, and actually as a consequence of doing a major piece of work with the banks, and we'll, I'll show you that in, in a few minutes, is to integrate uh, a, a more traditional financial measure, uh, a, a measure of market value, uh, which allows us to create a, a new metric of value. And what we call a total stakeholder value metric. And on this slide, um, while we've got a, a, a number of measures that we can use to indicate and give us a, a stakeholder value metric, the most common one that we're using for publicly listed companies is their price to book ratio. Uh, and when we include the price to book ratio, which is a reflection of the extent to which an organization is generating a market value in excess of its book value, uh, that allows us to create a comparative metric. It integrates a financial measure of value with our own human stakeholder measure of value, and it allows us to produce a metric called total stakeholder value. And for the Maturity Institute, this is a, a, a profound and important development because suddenly we have a measure, which is a measure of more holistic, whole system value, which we can show the, on a comparative basis against uh, any organization. And we can show the extent to which an organization is, is both serving society and generating conventional business value. So the organizations that score highest in what we call TSV terms, total stakeholder value terms, are both serving society and serving shareholders, uh, and in fact serving all stakeholders uh, as well as they can to, to um, uh, and, and actually, you know, those organizations uh, are the ones we are holding up and saying, you know, this is what we need to be, this is what we need to be aspiring to. We need to be, going back to Larry Fink's uh, suggestion is we need a stakeholder-based economy. We need organizations who are serving all stakeholders and not just uh, one of the, uh, one, one stakeholder group i.e. primarily shareholders. Um, so if we move on, I'll um, just, uh, I wanted to share with you how, how we rate organizations. And, and one of the things we, we uh, a decision we made some years ago as an institute is that uh, everything we do had to be open source. Uh, and attached to this webinar, you will, you will find something called an OM30 a spreadsheet or an own 30 uh, ratings uh, attachment and uh, this is how this is what we use to rate every organization that, that, that we rate and uh, the slide here is just a snapshot of some of the questions on that spreadsheet uh, the OM 30 actually has 32 questions we've added a couple since we originally designed it um, 
and uh, when you look at the questions, you'll start to get a sense of uh, how they capture the whole uh, human value system of an organization and how they link through to the culture of an organization. So we're, we're, we're taking something which is quite nebulous and ambiguous called culture, and we're actually looking at it through the lens of, of how human beings act and behave uh, to create value and risk, and we distill that down into a, a, a measurable rating. Um, as you go through the question set, what you find is that uh, all the questions actually interlink. Uh, there's a relationship between lots and lots of questions, but actually they're all independently important in terms of how they causally link to value outcomes. And actually we have some new academic uh, evidence that I'm actually presenting next week at the British Academy of Management, which, which highlights and verifies the fact that all these questions are important in themselves, but actually they relate to one another. And that's the nature of the whole system, is that if you, if you uh, create uh, some, uh, you know, a bonus scheme which uh, conflicts with your underlying purpose and values of an organization, then you create problems. If you have a reward system which aligns and integrates with purpose and values, then you can realize much greater, greater values. So that's, a, that's just an, an example of how these questions start to start to knit together. The other thing that you can see um, in the attachment is a link through to uh, what we called uh, a, an organizational maturity report. And um, uh, within the Institute, a number of different organizations are working with us and are allowed to go out and use our OM30 in practice. And what I've shared with you is one of those organizations who have trained under the Institute and are doing work with companies uh, actually in, in uh, Eastern Europe. Um, and uh, what you'll see there is an organizational maturity report which starts to bring to life how these questions um, are conveyed in an organizational context and actually we sat down uh, together with our, uh, our colleagues in Prague um, we've done it a number of times now and we sit down with CEOs and senior executives and go through this question set um, and you'll see what has been produced um, you'll see a, a sample rating the kind of diagnosis that OM30 uh, creates but also um, the sort of roadmap how do you how do you start to affect change? How do you reshape a culture that's not working? Uh, and that's a very important question because for most organizations, while they might understand that their organizations are not uh, anywhere near as perfect as they ought to be, the next question is, okay, you know, where on earth do we start? And, and that report gives you a nice, uh, a nice introduction to, to, to how that plays out in a very practical and, and, and real sense. So, um, you know, this is open source. You can take that spreadsheet back into your own organization and, and feel free to try it out, um, share it with your colleagues and, and, and see, see what discussion it, it, it it, uh, it promotes, and, 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 and uh, we'd be really interested in your feedback. Uh, one important thing to note is that only people that are trained uh, under MI can do approved ratings. So you're, feel, you're very free to go and use this internally, confidentially, secretively, and not say anything to us, but you can't produce an approved rating unless, unless, you're, unless you're trained. And I'm sure, actually, when you go through the questions, you'll realize that, that uh, some of them are conceptually quite simple, but the more you think about them, the more, the more sophisticated they, they are. But uh, anyhow, that's, that's available um, as a, uh, uh, through, through the, webinar, the webinar links. Okay. Um, how do bank ratings relate to, 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 to value? So one of our, you know, the single, you know, one of our single biggest questions is, does this matter? Does it really matter? We talk about culture. Uh, we talk about governance. We talk about the value of people. But, you know, our starting question within the Institute was how much, you know, how much does this matter? Um, is it consequential? Is it material? Um, and, of course, in a risk context, because of the, you know, because of the hundreds, if not thousands, of corporate scandals and failures over the last, 10, 20 years, um, we've, we've realized that it does matter, but often we view it in a negative context. It matters because if we don't get it right, we could, we could fail as an organization. Um, I worked at Arthur Anderson, which was a failed uh, accounting firm, and, and you know, Lehman Brothers is a, is, is, is a bank that, that, that failed. Uh, and, and so you know, we could have catastrophic collapse as a consequence 
uh, at least partly because we have toxic cultures and people behaving in a way which undermine our own organization. But what about the flip side? What does it look like from a value perspective? And what this slide tells us um, is that there seems to be a nice relationship between higher rated organizations and the value that they're creating, at least in shareholder terms. So uh, on the x-axis, you'll see our rating scale, uh, which goes all the way through to AAA. And I would point out that none of the banks that we've rated, in fact, no organizations that we've rated to date have reached AAA. Um, and, and so that tells you already that there's an enormous value potential that's missing from, certainly from the organizations that we've come across. Um, and there's a pretty, you know, there's a pretty widespread of ratings. Um, and um, on the y-axis, we've looked at ratings against price-to-book ratio itself. We wanted to see, okay, is there a relationship between ratings and the extent of value that's being created in a potential shareholder context. And, you know, very nicely, uh, you know, not, you would never expect a perfect line, but we've got Handelsbank, who is our top rated bank at the top right, and Barclays, who uh, remain our lowest rated organization, the bottom left. Um, and you'll see how they're reflected in price to book ratio terms. Uh, the, the, the price to book ratios that are on this slide are actually dated. These are numbers which change every day. Um, and just to give you some reassurance that this still holds up, Handels Banking is at around 1.57 today in Barclays. Price to book is at 0.47. So not a million miles away from where we actually plotted these numbers. Uh, actually, the last time we plotted these numbers was quite a few months ago. So. So that you know the the, the you know the, the the story the underlying analysis is still is still broadly uh, holding up and 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 so this is this is saying actually this does matter um, you know we can we you know here's here's a bank called Handels Bank and, and actually at the top of the slide you'll see a quote from Anders Bouvin who's their CEO um, and why are they top rated well well it, he simply says our business model and our way of working are based on a fundamentally humanistic approach. It's all about people. It's all about Handels Bank and Zone people. It's all about their customers. It's all about people that connect to them, uh, serving local communities, aligning people to that goal, and generating um, significant profits. Um, and so they're a, they're, a, they're a very good example of a bank that has, that has elegantly reconciled how to serve society and shareholders at the, at the same time. Uh, conversely, we have a slew of banks, uh, a lot of UK banks and, and American banks and others on the left-hand side, uh, who, are, uh, who are still relatively lowly rated um, and um, today continue to, to, to have cultural issues which need, which need fixing, uh, even though um, the, the risk of a catastrophic outcome in, 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 uh, in, in financial crisis terms may have been alleviated and mitigated because of because of the actions of, of, of central banks and regulators etc um, uh, our analysis is really saying you know most of these banks have not been fixed in governance and culture terms and they continue to lose value on a on a day-to-day -day basis and that value loss may not ultimately be a catastrophic uh, collapse of a bank but ultimately there's a huge amount of value being lost because these organizations are not realizing all the value they could from all the people that are connected to them in very simple terms. And what this slide is saying is, is, is the more that an organization can do that, the, the more value that they can create in, in, in conventional terms. Um, so if we just go on, I'll just pick one bank out uh, as, as an example. Um, and this is Wells Fargo. Um, I thought I'd pick a U.S. bank, and we're probably talking to a primarily a U.K. audience. Um, what this slide is showing is uh, our rating scale at the bottom. So you'll see the rating scale all the way through to AAA. Uh, and uh, you'll see on the left-hand side of what looks like a wall, uh, a little logo for Wells Fargo, which is hovering above its B-plus rating uh, on OM index. Its organizational maturity rating is B-plus. So in governance and culture terms, we're saying Wells Fargo is a B plus. Now, if you go to its own credit ratings, um, and this was a historic credit rating, but I looked them up yesterday, and I think it's they're pretty much around the same uh, score today. Uh, credit ratings of Wells Fargo, uh, if we if we plotted them on this kind of diagram, to the uh, well to the right hand side of this wall. So, so we have a disconnect. We have a gap 
between what the credit ratings agencies are saying about the financial health of Wells Fargo and what we're saying about its underlying cultural health, its overall organizational health in, in human systems terms. Um, so what this slide is showing is that Wells Fargo, from a governance and culture perspective, continues to be high risk and unstable from a, from a, from a human perspective. It is not a, a safe bank. Um, and that's quite an important finding because we're able to give uh, the bank, uh, regulators and investors, uh, an actual rating and a number, and we're scoring this. And we're saying this is a, this is a red flag. Um, and it's interesting, uh, if, uh, if, you, if, uh, if you read the FT, there was a recent FT piece specifically on Wells Fargo, and it continues to see issues arise out of the bank, the latest being a problem around uh, mortgages. Um, but you know, since, the, uh, since the big scandal that hit the bank a couple of years ago around uh, bank accounts and, and fraudulent bank accounts, a number of issues have arisen within the organization uh, and it's been interesting the the way the bank has responded to that which has ultimately been uh, a denial that uh, of, 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 that this is a systemic issue um, and and as time has gone on uh, the the system-wide issue the system-wide cultural problem which wells has has been increasingly evident and, and the ft piece that was uh, published i think a week ago is a really interesting piece because it talks to that very issue. It talks to the issue that culture at Wells has not changed and it still has a problem and, and it still has issues arising within the organization. And in fact, if you look at the corporate kind of uh, rap sheet and the violations that Wells has, 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 uh, has found itself in breach of over a much longer period of time, there are many, many. Uh, and, and if you do some research, what you find is that that the issue that happened a couple of years ago was but one issue and, and in a long list that are going back five, ten uh, plus years, uh, which should have been a red flag much earlier than it was. Um, but what we're able to do is, is, is identify uh, you know, a, a cultural red flag much, much, much earlier. Um, but of course, the, you know, the, the, the question is, okay, that's, that's where the organization is, um, but what on earth do we do about it? Uh, and again, um, you know, I'd go back to what I said earlier, which is, which is, you know, uh, if you want to steer on that, go and see the the uh, summary report, the organisational maturity report, and you'll get a sense of how our diagnostic, our cultural diagnostic instrument, can be used uh, to help a, C a board and a CEO or a senior manager to identify, uh, you know, what critical issues need to be fixed and in in what way and what uh, what outcomes we, we 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 would expect. Okay. Um, just one other piece of, of, of evidence from, from our, our uh, work we did last year. And at this point, I'll just, again, uh, in the attachments to the webinar, you will find uh, we, the report that we did, uh, the Banking Governance and Culture Report. We issued it in uh, June of last year. Um, but all the analysis, and there's quite a long report, but you are free to download that report and share it with uh, any of your colleagues. Uh, any of your uh, managers, uh, senior leadership, feel free to, to share it. Um, all the banks that we have rated have uh, been made aware of their rating and they've got a copy of the report where they wanted one. So we are not being secretive around what, what we do. We're not here to try and name and shame any organization. What we're trying to do is to say, understand where you are as an organization, understand the context of, of governance and culture of your organization, um, but also understand if you improve it, you will improve the value outcomes for customers, shareholders, uh, and actually workers as well, and, and, and suppliers, and anybody connected to your organization. Um, you know, there's no coincidence between uh, an organization like Handels Bank and other organizations who uh, are, high, are higher rated. You know, these are win-win these are uh, situations. We are not taking value away from shareholders if we serve society better. In fact, if we serve society better, ultimately we will create more value. And actually, 
what we find is that everybody prefers to work in an organization like that, or generally, uh, I would say absolutely everybody, but, but as a general proposition, um, you know, we want to work for organizations that make a contribution, a decent contribution, and if we make profit as a consequence of that, we shouldn't be apologetic about it. That's a, both the signs of, 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 a, of, of, a, of a healthy organization. Anyhow, the slide we have in front of you is just a, another couple of measures in our OM30 uh, question set, um, and they talk to trust and cooperation. And I just thought this would be interesting for you to see how this plays out across the banks that we uh, rated last year. Uh, trust, we look at trust specifically. Uh, we're looking at trust essentially in, in, in the leadership of organizations and, and how that plays out across all its stakeholders, so employees, uh, uh, consultants, customers, wider society, regulators, you name it. We're looking at to what extent we're measuring to what extent this organization uh, is trusted uh, from the very top because that's a that's a good place to get a, a pretty good measure of, of, of overall trust uh, and as you see handles banking comes out top on both trust uh, and also I talked about the linkages within the OM30 trust is a very very important driver of cooperation um, you know the more we trust uh, people um, you know, we have trusted relationships with customers, trusted relationships with employees, the more we're likely to cooperate. And cooperation is a critical driver of value. Uh, and so we measure both. And as you'll see here, Handels Banking scores pretty well on both those measures. Uh, and you'll see down below, we talked about Wells Fargo uh, and uh, RBS is interesting. Uh, it came out uh, lowest on trust and cooperation. Uh, and I think that's probably reflective of the, you know what uh, has happened within the organisation, and, 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 and even currently, where, where there's, uh, there's, 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 there's ongoing issues with uh, trust, particularly within small to medium-sized businesses and, and, and retail uh, uh, on the retail side as well. And, and of course, you know, trust and cooperation are fundamentally important. They're an important facet, uh, a factor of, of, of corporate culture, uh, and it is critical. That, that banks are, are trusted. If we don't trust our banks, then um, you know what, <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a poor place to be. But of course, you know, an organisation like Handels Bank can understands very clearly that high trust is absolutely paramount. We need to trust our people. If we trust our people, they'll do a better job. Uh, if we have great, strong, trusting relationships with our customers, we can actually sell more to them. Uh, they appreciate what we do, but we generate a two-way, mutually inclusive, uh, value-based relationship, and that and that's a reflection of, of, of that of that slide there. So I'm can I just make a comment there, Stu? Yeah, of course you can. <clears throat> I was just going to pick up. The, you pointed out that some of this data goes back to last year, um, but if you look at National Australia Bank, um, I think if you ask the question about trust uh, today bearing in mind that the Australians have got a royal commission looking into banking, which has really unsettled people because some of the stories that are coming out there that probably came out in the UK and America, you know, back back towards 2008, um, it would be interesting to see what trust score they would get now in the light of uh, the royal commission making some of these stories yeah. public for the first time. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think one of the points to make, uh, you know, when we do, when we do a rating, um, you know, we are – most of our ratings are external. We're using external publicly available information. Um, and the, the actual aim of the rating, is, it, again, is not to name and shame anybody or, or put these out in, in a public context. And uh, it, it's really to try and engage with the organizations themselves. Ultimately, while, while we work with investors uh, and the investment community, because you know, this is a, a rating that is, that is gaining increasing recognition in, in that world, uh, the goal of the institute has always been to to, to, to to work with senior senior leaders and organizations themselves and say, look, it doesn't really matter where you are today. What matters is you understand where you are and, and how you can move forward, but also understand, more importantly, you know, how much more value you can you can generate. And I think if we go to the last slide, um, uh, you know, the, the last slide is not a bank; it's actually Unilever. But I, but I wanted to show it, and I'll show it. And I'm, I'm sorry if it looks a bit messy and, and complicated. I'll try and make it as simple as possible. 
But we, we collaborated with an Australian-based organization called KVA Consulting earlier this year, um, who are strategy and company valuation experts, who had their own methodology of uh, how they value organizations and how they value organizations over a very long time horizon. And they approached uh, the Maturity Institute because they said that uh, they, were, they wanted to look at how our methodology could help them develop their own approach to how they uh, understand the value of organizations um, and how that looks going forward. And the left-hand side of this slide is, is a slide of Unilever as at the 31st of December 2017. Uh, and the top line in the graph is a, is a curve uh, on what they call a bow wave. It's a curve of expected market value over time. And you can see that the expectations around Unilever's value is projected right out, uh, you know, 2060, 2070. Um, and so what, what that, what's that telling us is that the market is expecting Unilever to deliver pretty good value over the very long term. Um, so, you know, there's, there's high expectations on the CEO like Paul Pullman uh, and, and his successor, whoever that may be in the next 12, 18, 24, 36 months. Or, or, uh, uh, the interesting thing from our perspective is, is, is that KBA took our, our, our ratings analysis for Unilever, and what they've been able to do is project the extent to which uh, organizational maturity forms part of the intrinsic value of, of, not the market value, but the underlying intrinsic value of the Unilever organization. So the top line is that is what the market is, is believing Unilever is going to look like over the long term. The, under, the, under, the curves underneath are, the, the top curve is that it represents the intrinsic value of the organization. And that's labeled organizational maturity, the EP bow, bow wave of organizational maturity. And what that's telling us is that there's a growing gap. The, uh, the, the, the maturity rating of Unilever is, is, is at this point in time, there's, a, there's an emerging gap between what the market is pricing Unilever at and what the underlying intrinsic value informed by its maturity rating is. And that gap, that, that's expected at this point in time to grow over time. Um, and that should be a concern. It should be a concern for the board, senior leadership team, and indeed every one of us that has Unilever stock in our pension plan. Because if there is a gap between what the market is saying it really believes its price is and what the underlying value of an organization is, then it may be a bubble which at some point uh, may well burst. Uh, and that's what we don't want to happen. So if we go to the right-hand side, um, the interesting thing about Unilever is that uh, it was, there was a, a, an acquisition attempt by Kraft Heinz, um, um, and we took a rating uh, pre and post that, which showed that Unilever was attempting to serve more than just its shareholders. Uh, its strategy was to try and serve a wider group of stakeholders and, and embed that in sustainability, what's called the Unilever Sustainable Living Plan. Um, post craft Unilever has returned to a more conventional shareholder driven management approach, um, cost cutting, share buybacks, uh, acquisition of high margin uh, organizations. And as a consequence, and we'll go back to the right at the start, the, the reversion to a more, a more profit driven paradigm has informed the culture of that organization and indeed the actions and behavior of people within it. Consequently, uh, it's undermined its own intrinsic value. And just the, 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 the two columns that you'll see on the right hand side, you'll see a purple box and you'll see a significant reduction in, in, in that box. And we are, uh, and what the KBA guys have, have, have asserted and helped to validate, because we were saying this before anyway, is that the value, the value of being uh, mature, uh, having a higher rating, uh, is, is measured in billions. And the value loss of becoming less mature uh, is a billion dollar impact. And that's an annual billion dollar impact. And so this stuff really, really does, really does matter. Uh, and this is just one snapshot of, of evidence, but it's a nice visual snapshot. And it's nice to, to take a pre and post acquisition organization. Anyhow, um, I'm done talking. Paul, do you want to just wrap up and we'll open it to questions for the, for the remaining part of the hour?
Sure, yeah, thanks very much. Um, yes, I think just before I um, cover this last slide and talk about maybe next steps for anybody who's listening in or watching in, um, if you've got any questions, you can obviously start uh, using the questions from the audience section. So you can throw questions at us and we'll ha have a chance to maybe have a few minutes uh, when we finish this last slide to go through any questions. So bear that in mind. And if you've got any immediate questions, just let us know. Um, just really to sum up where we are, um, I think the first thing to do is just emphasize that the Maturity Institute isn't just Stuart and I talking about OM30 and OM index. Uh, we have members, as I say, from you know, multi multidisciplinary backgrounds, and uh, they all have an active part in the Institute, both when we run projects and when we do research. Uh, so, for example, we have a, uh, one of our members leads on integrated reporting um, who comes from a finance and accounting background. We have uh, a remuneration specialist who helped us put together a CEO remuneration model that we think should be used by organizations. Uh, we have somebody else who looks after learning as a specialist area. So we're building our knowledge base and our evidence base, uh, and we're bringing in more and more specialists who can add something. But we all work together. That's the basic idea of the Institute. Whichever professional background we come from, we combine all of our disciplines and our expertise uh, so that it forms a, a much more holistic view of how you manage, whether it's a bank or any type of organization. So um, in terms of what you could do uh, having sat in on this webinar, <coughs> the, <coughs> excuse me, the first and uh, most obvious suggestion is if you um, get a copy of the OM30 uh, spreadsheet, and it actually uh, it's a very simple spreadsheet to use, and you can actually start scoring. The questions, as Stuart said, in themselves are all very simple. Um, but the more you get into maturity, the more re you realize the depth of it. But even so, even if you just take your existing employer as the example organization and go through the questions, I mean, it starts with purpose. What is the purpose of this bank? Uh, it's amazing when you do research and do ratings over 20 or 20 plus banks, and you ask that question across all of them. Uh, and you find that in, in one or two banks, like Handels Bank, and that the, the purpose is not only absolutely clear, but it's very societally focused, but it understands that by serving customers and society, it's more likely to serve its own uh, shareholders uh, compared to other banks who don't seem to be that sure about what their purpose is. Now, that, that's not a criticism. It's just a, a statement of the as-is situation. And, and we can understand why uh, banks particularly, I think, having been under a lot of pressure since 2008, uh, are looking at the world and saying, well, what is the best way forward? You know, what is, what's the future of banking uh, likely to look at and look like? And, and how do we need to aim for that sort of uh, idea of what a good bank, a healthy bank uh, is and has to be in the future? I think also from a personal point of view, from a personal development point of view, bearing in mind this is a webinar uh, for a professional institute, um, if you go through the questions just from an, your own personal point of view, it gives you a framework to look at your employer, to look at the role you have within your bank, and to ask yourself some questions. If you, if you go back to the, the point about learning, you know, what opportunities, apart from webinars like this, what opportunities do you have to learn? Uh, if you have ideas, uh, is there a systematic way of co collecting those ideas and doing something with them to make sure they get put into practice? Um, does anybody put a value on ideas in your bank? So there's a lot of questions there that you can just use as almost an aid memoir, if you like, um, for what you might be doing to develop your own uh, career uh, for the future. Certainly, if you, if you worked on all 32 questions from a personal point of view, and said, so I'm going to understand these more, I'm going to understand these in more detail, uh, regardless of what level you're at in banking at the moment. Um, certainly as you move up through the ranks, these will, you'll realize just how important these questions will become as, to, as you move to more senior levels. Uh, the second basic idea is, is basically a follow-on from the first one. Um, as you've already seen, we've, we've already rated 21 banks for the report we did last year as quite a, quite a major study, if you like. Um, if your bank is not on there, then you might want to take the questionnaire back to work and ask people if they'd like to find out how your bank scores. 
Um, you can score it yourself. I mean, it, it, you, you can have a stab at it anyway and just see what your initial score comes out as. We find actually that uh, CEOs we've spoken to, um, you know, when, when, when we put the question set in front of them for the very first time, how self-critical they are is our experience. Um, whatever the public image and whatever the annual report says and whatever the web website says, if you present, um, uh, you know, CEO's got a challenging job with straightforward but searching questions like what's the purpose of this bank um, and how well are you performing in terms of innovation and various other aspects and how good is your performance management system. Um, they are generally very self-critical and, and realize that there is always room for improvement. So it is always a positive exercise, or at least that's what it's designed to be, and that's what our, our experience of, of running these uh, sessions is. Um, the third point there on the slide is really just a general point in one sense about how would you learn more about what maturity means. Um, well, we finally got around to writing, in effect, the first textbook uh, for the Maturity Institute. It's only taken us, uh, it'll take seven years actually by the time it gets published next year. Um, but the manuscript is finished for the uh, the book which we're calling The Mature Corporation. Uh, the subtitle is um, a, role, uh, a model for uh, responsible capitalism underneath. Um, so uh, there'll be a book out next year if you want to read that. In the meantime, there is plenty of material that's available from the website uh, that you can download or, or even just read through some of the blog pieces uh, and various other bits of information and reference points on the website, we've, which will start to fill out the picture of what the Maturity Institute is about. Uh, in terms of further development, specifically in maturity, um, we are, as we speak, uh, talking to business schools about running maturity programs alongside MBA programs. Uh, both Stu and I have, have taught on MBA programs ourselves with our own specialist backgrounds. But what we're bringing to the world of MBA uh, courses is asking faculties in business schools to look at all of themselves as a whole, so all the different specialisms and disciplines, to actually see where they fit into the whole system. Um, and the Maturity Institute module will be explaining that in more detail. Um, and also, any research we, we produce, um, it will obviously be available. As Stuart said, it's open source. Everything we do is open source. Uh, the whole point of running the Institute is to improve professionalism and to give people a chance to uh, just to learn, really, about what, what really good mature organizations are, are capable of doing already. Okay, um, I think that's enough from me. Stu, do you want to add any comments before we see if there's any questions coming in? No, no, I think that's fine. I think it's great. Uh, Rima, I don't know whether you uh, want to pick up on anything, uh, yep. throw in some questions. Yes, we, we received a few questions, but I think we only have time for one or two. Okay, sure. Okay. So um, the first question was, what has been the response to your banking report from the banks you have rated? Okay. Um, well, I'll, do, you, I'll, do you want to go, Stu, or not? I'll go ahead. Um, I mean, it, it, interestingly, we, we, we make, uh, when we go out uh, and do the exercise, we, we, uh, we want to engage with the banks. We invite engaged in, engagement. Um, uh, with the banks that we've rated, um, we've had some engagement with um, one or two of the, high, uh, of the higher scoring banks. In fact, one of the chair, uh, chairs of uh, one of the major banks has got a copy of the rating at his request. Um, that's not a UK bank, but they wanted more information and, and they've got it. Uh, interestingly, uh, one of the banks, uh, a major US bank, um, contacted us, the investor relations team contacted us, and they said, um, this is really interesting, and they made the point that they were, what they were prepared to help the organization understand the nature of our rating and align sufficient and, and use sufficient resources to, to to get to grips with what we were what we were doing and how that worked in their own context and, and align their own systems towards it. Um, but their proviso was that it was um, because of their resource constraints. Um, they they would they would be interested if their institutional shareholders were going to pick up the phone and ask them about it. And, and that talks to you know what drives change uh, within the current system that we work within. Uh, particularly large organizations are often reticent to embrace something new. Uh, and we've worked with the investment community because it's a, 
it's a potential driver and catalyst of change, and, and that was an interesting dynamic from the exercise. We've actually done uh, some ratings of other banks since the study, um, and uh, we haven't uh, widely publicised those, but they are smaller banks. One is a UK challenger bank. Another is a, uh, main, uh, a continental European uh, described as a more sustainably oriented bank. Uh, both of those scored pretty well. Um, and I think they were pleased with their rating, but they wanted to engage in it because they thought it was interesting. So you know, we want to encourage uh, you know, all, uh, people and organizations to engage uh, in, in, in the rating because what we want to do is open up that dialogue. So that, that's, been, that's, been the, that's been the sort of general response from banks themselves. In a wider context, uh, we've been working with uh, the All Parliamentary Party Group for Banking, uh, done some work with them. Uh, we've engaged with the trade body, uh, and of course, it's been a it's been a route through to engaging with the Chartered Banks Institute. It's been a, you know that, that that's been a great connection to make and, and do what we're doing today. Great, thank you. Um, so one final question: um, Can regulators help companies to create better cultures? For example, FCA proposals for duty of customer care. Okay. Um, I mean, interestingly, um, since, our, since the study, we have actually engaged with a number of regulators. Um, uh, we've engaged with uh, the regulators in the US uh, and uh, a couple of regulators in, in, in the UK. Um, and um, for the regulators, the, the interesting thing is, as, as anybody in the banking world realise, if they look at the regulatory output of been to conferences around there's a lot of talk about culture. I mean, the FCA uh, I recently did a conference on culture, I, I believe. Um, and, you know, a, a lot of it is uh, a lot of talk about it and, 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 you know, building an understanding about it. I think one of the fundamental problems for regulators is that they have not been able to put a value proposition to organizations uh, about what better culture will create. You know, from a regulatory perspective, um, you know, it's more framed in a risk context, which is okay, um, but actually the upside is, is, is significant. <laughs> um, you know, the downside may be catastrophic failure, and, 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 and you know, that's where a regulator comes from. But, and I, I think one of the problems from a regulatory perspective is that a lot of, you know, more and more regulations, more and more compliance, and more and more tick spot, you know, box ticking. Uh, and this is not this is not an area where you need box ticking um, or compliance. It's an area where you need to build understanding that actually we're talking about the complexity of organisational health. And until we get to grips with that understanding, we can't put forward, you know, appropriate solutions. So coming back to duty of care, you know, uh, for customers, you know, potentially, you know, it could be an important development, but it's only one small part of a much bigger whole. And, and coming from a regulatory perspective, it's coming at it from a perspective of the down, you know, the downside problems, probably from you know mistreatment of, of, of customers versus you know what the upside is, which would be a you know a handles banking sort of model. Of, of it should be all about the customers, or, or a, a metro bank. You know, if it's all about the customers, we you know it's all about a value proposition. So that would be my you know, initial suggestion around that question. Great, thank you. Well, can I can I just add something, Rune, very quickly, okay. just to, before we sign off? Um, the, the this subject matter probably seems very complex. It is, uh, but at the end of the day, um, we keep things very simple in in a practical sense. And having having a set of a lim limited set of questions that people that's all we need to work through. We keep it very simple and very practical. And, and the reason we set up the Institute is we're all pragmatic people and we're not just interested in professionalism, we're interested in how practice works. Um, if anybody wants any more information from us, uh, my own email is on that final slide, so please feel free to drop me a line. If you've got any further questions or, or you need other information, just let us know and we'll happily send you whatever we've got. Okay? Thank you, Paul. Well, this brings us to the conclusion of our webcast. So therefore, I'd like to take the opportunity to thank Stuart and Paul for providing such an invitable webcast, and of course, to our listeners as well. For members of the Chartered Banker Institute, today's webcast can be recorded as part of your ongoing CPD. Please remember to record this via the logbook in the members area of the website. The slide pack will also be available to all listeners after today's presentation. We would also welcome your feedback on today's webcast. 
Once again, we'd like to thank you for your participation and thanks for listening.